Blog Talk Radio. Haunted Sea with host Scott Martis. Let's see. All right, this is Scott Martis. Welcome to another episode of The Haunted Sea. This particular episode is a recap of my most recent trip to Lake Champlain a couple of weeks ago. And the first collaborator to meet me up there was Chatan Noir, a well-known uh, author and lecturer. Hello, Chatan. Hi. Would you like to uh, fill in everyone about your credentials? Sure. I am the managing writer for the Squatch GQ magazine company, which covers Squatch GQ, Squatch Digest. G Hunter Magazine, which focuses on ghosts and the paranormal, Watchers Magazine, which focuses on UFOs and extraterrestrials, and then we have several new titles that are in production, including Dinosauria and Prehistoric Creatures, Weird Travels, and the Bowden, the Bigfoot series. I am also the lead investigator for the North American Dogman Project here in Michigan. I am also a teacher at both Kellogg Community College in Hastings and Battle Creek, uh, Michigan, and a college in Perrysburg, Ohio called Owens Community College. I teach two courses, one on cryptozoology, one on the paranormal history of the Great Lakes. I do presentations, podcasts, and Zoom presentations at libraries and museums and paracons all across the country. Yes, and as probably many of the listeners know, we were attempting to um, get a new champ investigative uh, body off the ground called the Lake Champlain Zoological Inquiry with you, myself, Alexander Petikov, Carrick St. Laurent, Nash Hoover, uh, Eli Watson, and the Sanborn brothers, Jeremy and Ryan. So you were the only one that was able to actually come up this trip, unfortunately. Um, Well, I'm glad you came up. I'm just saying I wish the rest of the guys had been able to come up. Um, Before you came up, I was under the impression that Jeremy and Ryan were coming and probably Alexander at some point. But things just didn't work out. Um, So. You came up on June 6th, and we went to St. Albans Bay to attempt to get some hydrophone recordings and underwater video. And I was having problems with the underwater camera. It turns out to have been not formatting the SD card correctly. So that's why I was unable to get any good video footage with the underwater fishing lure camera. However, we did get to do some hydrophone experiments. Um, And for people that are not aware, St. Albans Bay is considered to be one of the prime possibilities for the location of Sandra Manzi's photograph. If you see the bay from a certain angle, you can see the beach at the park. And it looks very much like the beach that you see in the background of Sandra Manzi's photograph. So, 
<clears throat> you had an underwater speaker that would play sounds underwater. So the experiment we attempted is we had you play the um, 2003 echolocation-like sounds from Lake Champlain over your underwater speaker at the same time that I was listening with my dolphin ear hydrophones. And the idea was is that hopefully we could have attracted something with the underwater sounds to make it think that there was another individual of its species around. Um, part of the problem with working at Lake Champlain this time of the year, I like to go usually later around August or September, there is less boat traffic. But in June and around the 4th of July, there's always a lot of boat traffic. Uh, we didn't have access to a boat. So we were kind of stuck on the shore. Um, I had a raft, but I was suffering from uh, gout in my foot. So that made that somewhat problematical at that particular time. So we went to a boat launch on St. Albans Bay, set up on the dock there. And we had to listen around a bunch of boat noise. And um, what do you call them? Um, Jet skis, jet skis, yes. Um, but overall, you know, it was an interesting attempt. Um, I'm still analyzing the hydrophone recordings, trying to figure out a way to filter out all the noise and get down to if anything unusual might be buried in all that noise. Um, but it's interesting when you listen to the uh, recording we made, you clearly hear the sounds from 2003 being played on your speaker. Well, that's because the speaker was only a matter of three feet away from your recording device. So yes. it was obviously picking it up very clearly. Um, and uh, sound travels much faster through water. So there wasn't really anything in between each device to damper the sound. Yeah, we would have had much better result if we'd have gone out on a boat and gotten out in deeper water away from so much boat traffic. I mean, the whole time we were trying to do it, there were people trying to launch boats and get boats out of the water and rev in their engines and all that. And you hear a lot of that on the uh, audio. Uh, I'm actually after after we conclude this interview, I'm going to I'm going to patch in the audio of what we recorded so everyone can hear it. So this was your first trip to Lake Champlain? Yes, that was my first trip to Lake Champlain and uh, my first time investigating in St. Albans. Mm. Well, there's been a lot of sightings in St. Albans. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do some work there um, is due to the fact that there were two sightings with photographs and video from St. Albans Bay last summer. So I was hoping that maybe luck would strike twice, you know? It really depends on the time of the day and uh, the time of year that that evidence was collected last year. Because obviously during the daytime, there's high boat traffic and much less likely a chance of capturing anything um, in the water obviously the boats are going to disrupt that and make the creatures leery of coming to the surface. Uh, well, but from what I saw, that is way too popular, way too active in, of an area yeah. to add any actual investigation work. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the two sightings from last summer were in that area and did happen during the daytime. So, you know, it's just... Um, you never know, but but yeah, I hear what you're saying. I normally like to work in areas that are isolated. Sometimes those are hard to find, and when, at a time of year when it's not too cold, but there's a lot less boat traffic after the kids have gone back to school. You know, the August September time of year, it's not the water is not so cold that the animals might not be active, but like I said, there's a lot less boat traffic. Um, 
one of the reasons we were there so early this year is because several members of the team wanted to go in June because of their conflicting schedules. And it was other projects from the other team members that was the reason they were not able to come this year. Hopefully we'll be better organized next trip. But I want to say I'm, I'm glad you came up. At least we tried to do a little bit, you know. Um, part of the problem was I was trying to get those hydrophones set up and didn't know exactly what what kind of jacks I needed to interface between the recorder and the hydrophones. And luckily I got that figured out. I wish I had a sampler that would sample higher um, ultrasound frequencies. I'm working on that, but unfortunately at the last minute I was not able to get anything that would sample any higher than uh, 44 kilohertz. And you cut that in half and that gives you the highest frequency sound that you can sample, which would have been 22 kilohertz. So at the very least, if we'd have got something in the audible range, the original sounds from 2003 had an ultrasound component that was inaudible to the human hearing range, but that did register on the sonogram, which is a chart that shows the entire frequency spectrum. The main portion of what you hear played on these different documentaries is uh, is in the audible human hearing range. So even if we would have heard something and wouldn't have been able to capture the ultrasound part of it, we would have heard the audible portion on the on the recording. So it wasn't completely useless. But I'm hoping to get something that will sample up to like the 300 kilohertz range. They make to make a sampler now, a listening device that's made for recording bat ultrasound, which is way up in the same high frequency range. And I'm hoping to figure out a way to get one of those and adapt it to the hydrophones. So um, that's one project I'm gonna work on over the winter. So the next day, we took a trip to Burlington and you went to the Echo Center. What was your impression of the Echo Center? Um, I, I do believe that they could uh, expand upon the CHAMP exhibit that they have there um, for a facility that is proclaiming to the world that they are um, CHAMP friendly and has uh, it on their brochures and, and uh, advertisements. The actual area of the champ exhibit was quite minute. Um, it, it was a board that was maybe five feet high by 10 feet wide with a looped video that is several years old um, playing different uh, eyewitness accounts. Um, but you can tell that it's a very old video. And they do have the Mancy photo on display, but it's behind glass. So I, I think that if um, if they want to continue with being a champ destination, that they really need to embrace it more and uh, add more details, make it more elaborate than just a minute uh, exhibit in a museum aquarium that is uh, proclaiming that it's a champ destination. One thing I've always been impressed by, though, they have done a really good job of putting the fish that live in the lake on display. You've got a really big tank with lake sturgeons, which are considered to be the largest known fish in the lake. Um, I noticed even now they've got some uh, pikes and musculungs in there. Which they yeah, they, they did have, they had, you know, aquatic displays with the different fish and turtles um, that frequent the lake. Um, it would hard to be say that, you know, that any of these fish, um, you know, maybe if there were several of them together, that could be a, you know, a disguise for, you know, what people might be thinking is a champ sighting. Um, 
but most of these these fish were three feet and under in the tanks that they were in. So um, while they did have them there, you know, it, uh, it it's not a true representation of the size that these fish can reach in, you know, natural settings. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the largest ones that have been pulled out of the lake have been right around seven feet long. There was a dead six foot nine inch one that washed up five years ago in Isle of Mott. So we know there are seven foot fish out there in the lake. Um, the interesting thing about a lot of the fish that live in Lake Champlain is that they're living fossils that were around during the Mesozoic. So these fishes would have been contemporaries with plesiosaurs and mosasaurs and ichthyosaurs and the marine reptiles that people invoke when they try to identify some of these lake monsters and sea monsters, which is interesting. Also, the early whales would have been feeding on these fish too, things like Bacillosaurus. Um, and we also have the armor plated fish, the placoderms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those are those are way back. You know, the lampreys are actually related to those early armored fish. They're jawless fishes. They don't have a lower jaw like a normal fish. The lampreys and the hagfish are the only survivors of that very early fish lineage that largely died out during the uh, Devonian. But we do know that they, we have fossil remains of them um, oh, yes. going as far yes. into Indiana. So uh, we do know that they were in the waterways around here. But as yeah. for a living species that could be still living in the lakes today, um, I don't think we're looking at a a thirty foot creature. I'm I'm thinking at the biggest, probably a twelve to fifteen foot creature. Yeah, I've usually based on several different lines of evidence. I've I've rounded it off to about fifteen, sixteen feet, which is still big, you know. But it's not yeah, that that is a know, sizable animal. If you had a very small population, viable breeding population that might be just on the edge of survival of 16 to 18 foot animals in a 120 mile long lake, you know, that is within reason to accept that something like that might be able to hide and escape detection. But that still doesn't tell us where are the dead ones, you know, if they really exist in our animals. You know, they they live and die, and the, their remains would be found somewhere on the bottom, most likely. And it's not I, unreasonable to think that a dead one would occasionally wash ashore. Now, we don't know if something like that might have happened in the past. I would sure it would be a very rare event, but at the same time, there's no documentation of anything like that. So, and well, we've got, oh, go ahead. It depends on the temperature of the water. The colder the water, the less likely the chance of a creature bloating and uh, coming to the surface. So if it's very cold waters, when it dies, then it's going to stay on the bottom. Yeah, and you've got to think about are, There's not a whole lot of ROB or submersibles um, yeah. or people who own them that are investigating the bottom of Lake Champlain. So you really don't know what is on the bottom of like just like here in the Great Lakes and at no time is Lake Champlain going to be drained to the point where you could see um what exactly is on the bottom also yeah. it depends on what the fish's body is made of if it's made of all cartilage uh it's going to sink to the bottom it's it's not just like sharks it's going to sink it's not going to float and wash yeah. up on shore so it depends on a lot of different factors but Essentially, you're looking for several needles in a field of hay, and yeah. the the chances of pinpointing one's location um, is really, you know, if as much research and investigation and expeditions were done on Lake Champlain as Loch Ness, we could probably have more affirmative action um, and more uh, explanations of what's going, you know, what this creature yeah. is. 
Instead, we it, it's up to citizen scientists and cryptozoologists to go investigate and see what kind of fi- findings and results that they can collect. Well, hopefully, you know, um, they're still finding shipwrecks hundreds of years old on the bottom of the lake. So maybe one day they will find a piece of the body of something. I just don't know, you know. Yeah, it would it would have had to have been fossilized before the water covered it for it to even be still intact today. Um, generally, when something sinks to the bottom, that is a food source for everything living in the lake. Yeah, so, I was going to mention the scavengers. Yes. Yep. So, like you said, if it's got a cartilaginous skeleton, then the skeleton itself would probably disappear very quickly yes. over time um and like i said the 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 deeper the lake the colder the depths and when something sinks down to those depths you get the no bloat no float factor like we have in lake superior and yeah. it's the reason why they say lake superior never gives up for dead because nothing there when it gets that cold and it's in a refrigerated state the the bacterias um the gases do not form so therefore there is no bloating and nothing rises to the surface it stays in the the depths of the lake yep well there are remains of trees uh hundreds of years old sitting at the bottom of Loch Ness and that's the reason why they're Mm -hmm. preserved in the cold water and the silt on the bottom Um, so before you came to meet me, you stopped in Port Henry and met with Andrea Annecy, correct? Yes. How was that? Oh, that, that was fantastic. Um, Andrea and her husband, uh, were wonderful hosts and took me on a tour of Port Henry, uh, showed me all the champ. Uh, hot spots in the in the uh, sightings um, uh, welcome board, and uh, that that was actually one of the highlights of the trip. Um, being able to talk to them and see the different uh, things that make Port Henry uh, the home of Champ, um, the the float uh, that they yep. have, and the the beach um, statue and, and stuff like that. So that that was actually very, very uh, nice. Kind of hard to get to, but um, definitely worth a stop and uh, exploration of. I was able to get over there the last day I was there on the 23rd. So I got to meet them as well. Very nice people. Um, and I just want to say, you know, I know we had some problems with the equipment and trying to find a place to do the experiment and all that I, i'm i'm sorry about that you know all the time you problems crop up that you don't see coming you know that's just part of it and um, i'm sorry things didn't go as well as i was hoping but maybe next year we'll do better well i think next year there needs to be an itinerary in place of what is going to be going on each day each person needs to be responsible for their own equipment and knowing how to use it, knowing what it, they need to make it work correctly um, before they actually get there. Um, I think that is a very important part of being an investigator of knowing your equipment, knowing how to set it up, knowing how to record on it and having all of your pieces in place. But definitely there needs to be an itinerary. Um, people need to know what their equipment can do and how to use it. And a better location needs to be um, picked, one where we have access to the beach at all times um, so that we can monitor the bay or the lake surface 24-7 um, with either surveillance cameras or uh, static cameras and not have to be driving a half an hour back and forth to get to the location that we're investigating. Yeah, well, that was that was kind of, you know, I chose the location in Enosburg, 
because of its closer proximity to St. Albans, because that was under the impression when we were initially planning all this, that those guys were going to show up and we were going to be working out of St. Albans. So normally I'm closer to Burlington. The last uh, part of my trip, I was located at my friend's house in Jericho, which is a lot closer to Burlington. It's like a 20 minute drive. So yeah, you know, a lot of the time you don't, you don't know what's going to happen until you you're there and, and things are happening on the ground. So again, I'm sorry. I, I did the best I could do under the circumstances and hopefully next year we can be better, uh, planned out and more people will show up to participate. So, um, well, I guess that pretty much wraps it up as far as I know, is there any last thing you want to add? Um, just that, you know, uh, I, I think that there is a group of creatures still in the lake that, um, have not been documented by science and, Hopefully, with more sightings, more technology, we can narrow down the uh, the clues and come up with a better idea of what this creature is. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the show, and uh, I'll be in touch. Okay. Take care. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, here are the original sounds from 2003. Recorded by Elizabeth von Lugenthaler. Here are faint echolocation-like sounds recorded by William Jorginus and myself at the mouth of the Al Sable River near where the Budet video was filmed. Thank <laughs> you. 
And here is a three-minute segment from the sounds we recorded in St. Albans Bay, June 7th, 2021. And you will hear the original 2003 sounds being played once through Shatan's underwater speaker, but the other sounds you hear sound like very similar to the faint echolocation we recorded in 2017 at Osable. Okay, after Chatan Noir left on the 10th of June, my friend Charles Cater, who is a journalist and investigator, came up to join me to help me from Messina, New York. Hello, Charles. Hello, Scott. How are you? Fine. Do you want to inform the audience about where you do your writing? and this, the general subject matter you usually cover and investigate? Sure, thank you. My focus has been on the Haudenosaunee, Kanyagahaga, 
which are people of the land of the Flint, Native American news information, do some investigations of sightings of unknown animals in the St. Lawrence River, and also follow up on some regional reports involving other paranormal themes. So I'm in touch with Paul Bartholomew in Whitehall, New York, and I run a lot of those updates with by him and he sends his greetings to you today so we're a regional outfit up here with he and i mostly staying in touch with each other yeah and um uh, you are an onita i'm a mohawk i'm turtle clan and that's through my mother and uh the oneidas are our uh our younger brothers within the con- Iroquois Confederacy wampum belt. All right. Well, I'm sorry if I got that confused. I, I thought you were identified as Oneida, but it's part of the larger Iroquois Confederacy. Yeah, we're the keepers of the Eastern Door, which includes Lake Champlain area. Yeah. But you're actually located closer to the Finger Lakes region. I'm located right at the confluence of Ontario and Quebec on the St. Lawrence River. So we consider ourselves international uh, native North American community. Yeah. So how far are you located from the border where you live? Five, five miles at the most. Yeah. So when you come over to met me, we were literally five minutes from the Canadian border in Enosburg. Probably real similar to where I would normally be distance wise yeah. because we don't consider it a border. But uh, it's a line that was drawn without our consent. Yeah, well, I can understand that perspective. But we were um, we were camped out on my friend Julio Rivera's farm in Enosburg, Vermont. And on uh, June 11th, we went over to Lake Memphremagog, which is another lake in Vermont and Quebec that is supposedly inhabited by unknown creatures like Lake Champlain. And it actually has a longer history than the recorded accounts of the Champlain monster, believe it or not. There are reports from Memphremagog documented as early as 1798. So um, we went over there with the hydrophones and an underwater camera. And you were there when I accidentally lost my camera and like Memphremagog. I was there. I witnessed that. That was a sad moment of a longer day. Yeah. Um, I think we would have, you know, we first we went to some um, fishing access point that had a pier. And if we could have worked from there, I think we would have had better luck. We'd have been well, in somewhat deeper water, but we got run off from there, unfortunately. Well, that was semi public access, proudy trailer area and there were some unwritten rules that were not uh, not followed and my my concern with you was the wind was blowing towards you and you had shallows to deal with and i didn't know about any driftwood that was in that where it got a little deeper the wind yeah. wasn't working in your benefit at that moment yeah the, the weather was crazy the whole time i was up there I mean, like one day it was 90 degrees and the next night it would be 55 and I was freezing to death. And the weather kept flip-flopping and you never knew what it was going to do five minutes from the next time, you know? Well, I would have done a public meeting in that community and tried to gauge some idea of on the Vermont side to see how many sightings people routinely would have reported and maybe would have done the same thing on the Quebec side. Yeah. Because I think that was a lively spot there for... When well, I did point, see some, we did see some fish jumping, I remember. When I pointed out those schools moving that, though, in those patterns, that, that was interesting, to say the least. Yeah. Well, it's, um, it doesn't have a lot of the fish that are in Lake Champlain, and one of the reasons why is that when a lot of the fish were migrating from the Mississippi River Basin 
through the Great Lakes into Lake Champlain, they were unable to migrate further west or further east in Vermont because of a collapse of a set of waterfalls that blocked them from moving further east from Lake Champlain. So in other words, you have a situation where you have a lot of the same fish from the Mississippi River Basin in Lake Champlain, and they're found all over New York State, but they're not found further east than Lake Champlain in Vermont. You won't find like the gars and the bow fins and the sturgeons in Lake Mipramega because they were blocked from migrating further east to get into Lake Mipramega about 6,000 years ago. I guess all I could say would be if you did one of those volume DNA studies, you might get a good sense of what your fish stock is there oh, at absolutely, the present time. Yeah. Like the environmental DNA survey that was done at Loch Ness, that needs to be done at Lake Champlain and at Memphis Magog as well. Exactly. So while we're here, do you want to talk about some of your tribal traditions regarding these animals? Well, I think one of the issues related to reports, as you say, the earlier reports in the Lake Memphremagog, that's irrelevant to the oral tradition of the people that were there, Abenaki Confederacy, Wabanaki Confederacy. So those weren't written down in many cases, or if they were, it was near that, that confluence of the French traders and trappers coming down. And the Franciscans and the Jesuits would have been ones who would have written some of those accounts down. And you always wonder, is there some vestige of a lesson or an ethical, um, an ethical creature that exists because they're trying to prove a point that there's evil somehow related to that natural wildlife. So, we talked about the stone giants in the past in relation to Adirondack traditions. Th those aren't things that we would, we would see routinely now because, for one, we aren't in those same areas of the Adirondacks where we would have routinely been previously. So th there's some disassociation from where we territorially were located and our trading routes and then the areas we're in now. And the only reason that there's any Mohawk population inside of the United States is because there were friends of the Mohawks that were friends with George Washington, and that created some openings for um, a little bit of levity because a lot of the Mohawks in the Mohawk Valley, they helped the loyalists uh, evacuate to the up north of the Canadian border after the Revolutionary War was completed. Mm -hmm. So there you have that departure on the history that it moves from a religious scribing to the colonial records. And of course, George Washington, he gave away a lot of land that would have been border land to his veterans because he needed them on the borderline to defend the 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 new um country's you know territory needed to be watched and those guys had the most um skin in the game but it, it really hurt those groups that didn't align with washington and within a few years the treaties were intended to destabilize the iroquois confederacy so a lot of our understanding is now post and past United States formation with a little bit of a thunder there in the War of 1812, which also kind of um, shook out all the blankets there that had been in place since the Revolutionary War. And then following that, you see the reservation set up in that same era. And once the reservations were set up, it was essentially an end of the Indian threat to the, you know, the founding fathers and their planning. So I think that when we associate the regional history, we have to look past those written records and look to some oral ones. And the oral ones that I would point to talk about a creature there in the lake, which was known for 
teeth or the teeth were visible as far as when it was viewed by people who then shared their stories. And I don't have any doubt that the gar could have been something that you're exactly referring to. I'm less in, uh, inclined to think it's sturgeon. And of course, I'm partial to the turtle as a explanation because of my turtle clan. Yeah. So out of curiosity, what was the Mohawks um, position in the French and Indian Wars? The, the position was one of strength because uh, Johnston Hall there at uh, Fonda, New York, he was the Indian contact for the crown. And then there was the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which was intended to stabilize the frontier area, which reached up into the Adirondacks to an area called the Sunday Rock in Colton, New York. And when you go down, you'll see a lot of places called West Point. And the West Point was what the Royal Proclamation was adhering to because the crown realized there was massive trading and destabilization along that line. And the, the monarchy wasn't able to maintain an order or furthermore, a taxation plan for that area. So until that, that that's a neutral area there between the end of the French and Indian War and the beginning of the Revolutionary War. If I could live at any time in history, it would be during the French and Indian War. Yeah, well, you know, related to Champ, one of the most interesting things from that period, there are a series of colonial era powder horns from around 1759, 1760, there's four of them, all from the Lake Champlain general area, that depict some kind of dragon-like creature engraved on the powder horn, and they're all made, they are believed to have all been made by the same artisan. I may have shown you this, I don't know. Joe Zarzinski features one of them in his book, but I've actually found three more just like it, and it's all believed that they were made by the same artisan. Czar's uh, uh, photo is it's a good copy in that book, and I understand the art form. I'm always concerned about the historical dating because it's hard to put a, a date on that, and and it's relatively recent to do carbon fourteen dating. So yeah. I have to believe that it is uh, vintage from that era. I also am aware that there's a French influence there. And I can only guess that there's possibly some Jesuit influence. Well, there, uh, was some, there was some theory that the creature depicted on the powder horns was meant to be a griffin. But another powder horn expert looked at them and said that, no, they're meant to depict this creature called a hell horse. And digging back into the origins of the legend of the hell horse... Evidently, the hell horse is meant to be the same creature as the water horse or the Kelpie from Celtic mythology. And they, they trace it all the way back to Norwegian beliefs. So it's possible that the creature on this powder horn is meant to represent a water horse which is what they think is a mythologi mythological version of these lake monsters, at least you're in the Celtic traditions. You're knowledgeable on this topic. I recognize that. I, I will continue to assert that there's some socio-religious overtones to some oh, of, of the graphics. Of course. And I'm sure, you know, you have to deal, peel away the layers of the onion, you know, to get to what was originally behind it, but it is intriguing. And considering the area that they came from and the time period, it, it may be the only <clears throat> indication of anything related to these Lake Monster reports that we have to point to from that period. I mean, it's tentative, but... So what were your impressions of Lake Memphis Magog? 
Well, I would ad- advise anyone going there. It's somewhat of a insular community. There's probably a, a pretty good rumor mill in that area. They've got it zoned a certain way that emphasizes some of the the um, waterfront and some of the vacation time. I don't know what it's like in the winter. They had a shindig going on there near the public pier where we were accessing the waterfront. That looked to be pretty orderly, but at the same time, you could tell they put some money into that public access area. The, the only thing I would say is it looked like it was a little bit tight. So if you're going to go there, you probably want to coordinate a little bit in advance and try to find a friendly ear to, to access a little bit to so smooth out any contact you have with the locals. I didn't yeah. find it unfriendly, but it was a like it was a tight knit community that when you do something a little different, it might raise some eyebrows. And we may have raised an eyebrow or two just because we weren't towing a RV trailer behind us. Yeah. Well, you know, there was a regular investigator at Lake Memphis, but unfortunately he died of a heart attack about 15 years ago. French-Canadian guy named Jacques Boisvert. Okay, that's great. Sightings. I, I, I'm sorry to hear he passed away, but I was trying to contact that Beauvert family to see if there was any modern relatives. It's a common name in the region. I didn't hear yeah. back from any of them. Well, he was actually living on the Canadian side in Magog, Quebec, which is way up at the other end of the lake on the Canadian end. Most of the lake is in Quebec. I think maybe the lower third is in Vermont, but there are occasional sightings from the Vermont side. So, I'd love to hook that ferry boat. That ferry boat only started running again a few weeks before we were there. It had been down for a few years. I sent them an email and said if there's any information they'd like to pass along for sightings or anyone that's got a witness report on their uh, deck that they could make a report. I just gave them my contact, but if I heard anything, I'd pass it along to you, Scott. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'm working on trying to analyze the hydrophone recordings we were able to get, the ones from Lake Memphis, and the ones from Peru, and especially the most intriguing ones are the ones we got at the Holiday Harbor Inn in Alberg. Because some of those sounds do sound like the 2003 echolocation-like sounds that Liz von Mungenthaler recorded. But part of the problem is, is it could possibly be the sound of boat motors turning over or possibly the, the pier that I was on creaking. It's very ambiguous, and I'm trying to... To, to take all these recordings, the ones I got with you and the ones I got with Shatan, and run them through audio filters to try to isolate some of the sounds. So that's an ongoing piece of work that I'm working on now, which now I'm, I'm, I'm set up in a, in, a, in a good place that I can sit down and actually work on this stuff. When we were up at Julio's, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of room to set things up and analyze stuff like that, you know. And Julio's kids were running around, there were animals everywhere, so now I'm in a in a good position that I can sit down and really concentrate on this stuff. But what I'm going to do when I put this episode together is I'm going to chop out clips from the different audio hydrophone recordings as samples so people can hear what we're talking about. Did you get a chance to hear any of that stuff? Well, I did play back as much as I could. I'm by no means, I have no background in those, in that technology. My father used to build Lorenz depth finders from crystal kits. He was a ham radio operator. He could build radios. So that was something that he had some knowledge of, but the thing always acted up. By the way, the, um, the portable sonar unit that I accidentally left in your truck. Yes. You're more than welcome to, to take that out and try it 
an experiment with it till I come back if you want to do that. Okay, I've I've generally stayed off the river here, but I'll keep that in mind. I'd hate yeah, to I lose maybe it. Maybe you might could make a trip over to Seneca Lake and try it there because there have been some interesting uh, things happening over there too. I believe there's something in Seneca Lake. Seneca Lake is probably six hours south of me. Yeah, well, it's, I think it's closer than Lake Champlain, isn't it? Uh, Lake or, Champlain or is, it, is, is less than three hours from me. Oh, okay then. Well, be, be, my, be my guest to take it back to the lake and try it there, you know? Well, my, I'm a librarian, so the way I approach equipment handling is I do a lot of research in advance, and my schedule is a little occupied presently, so it's all I can say is the more you know your equipment, the more you'll get use of it that you can yeah. build on. And if you had more baseline, you could start to filter some of those environmental sounds because you could clearly hear the the pier had a rhythmic motion in the latest hydrophones that you had. And that pier was particularly dilapidated as far as it it moved. The buoyancy on it had some effect on the, the, the sound latent sound environment so yeah. you'd want to try to filter that as best you could yeah let's well, be I'm... honest when you had access to mr drand guinness's boat you were such in a sweet spot to do oh, that depth of uh, the hydrophone needs some depth Absolutely. in order to, to to get the best sounding on it Oh, and, I know this. And that depth there couldn't have been excessively deep that close to the shore. So No, it wasn't. Yeah, unfortunately. But the hydrophones were sensitive enough to pick up anything, you know, within a few miles. So if, if there was something there, it would have picked it up most likely. And the recordings from Peru, New York were interesting because... They sound like possibly a combination of these echolocation-like clicks and fish sounds. Some of the sounds I recorded at Peru sound like the croaking sounds that a freshwater drum makes, which is a known fish in the lake. They make this croaking sound almost like a frog. So I think what I might have from the Peru recordings is a combination of possible echolocation-like clicks and fish sounds. Because they do resemble the sounds made by the freshwater drum, and they also bear some resemblance to an anomalous sound that was recorded in uh, Lake Seljord in Norway back around 2000. Adam Davies was involved in that. And I'll, I'll, you know, in between the interview segments that I'm doing on the show, I'll play the different sounds. And in the finished episode, everyone will be able to hear the comparisons. I understand. I guess I would hope that you could have multiple sets to kind of oh, oh, kind of layer them. Mm -hmm. And then, then, then you can start to isolate some of that, yeah. that environmental background. Because it's, yeah, so. it's more than white noise. It, it, yeah. It, it definitely, you could filter some of that out so you didn't hear it competing with your what your ear could pick up let alone yeah, so what a spectrum analyzer would show one of the reasons we went to peru new york is an attempt to get in close to where the boat it video was filmed and also where me and will got the sonar contact back in 2017 if you actually go to the mouth of the all river you have to pay to get into the campsite and it's hard to get in there to the mouth of the river because there's so many campers there. So I thought going to the um, marina in Peru was close enough that we could have got something. And I did get some interesting sounds. But I thought the most interesting results were from um, Alberg and Peru, at least as far as the hydrophones go. Well, everywhere you went, you were seeing a lot of uh, watercraft being trailered out and trailered into the waterways. So yeah, 
that's why that's one reason I like to usually go in August, September, because it's still warm, but there's a lot less boat traffic. I kind of got wrangled into going in June because of uh, the other people involved in the Lake Champlain Zoolog Zoological Inquiry wanted to go earlier in the year. So I was kind of capitulating to them, and most of the people that wanted to go in June didn't show up for various reasons. Which I'm not blaming anybody, it just uh, things came up, you know? From a practical sense, dealing with all that tourist, watercraft, water pleasure you know people that if i was a monster of any sort trying to stay alive i would see those as my main antagonist and i'd steer clear of them wherever i could so that's yeah. the only thing is you're you're fighting city hall when that many people are surrounding where you're at but there's a guy that lives in colchester a diver that dives in, in, on shipwrecks a lot named gary lefebvre and I was hoping to get with him to get access to his boat. He goes out regularly into Colchester and um, to uh, All Sable, New York, in that area. Um, but unfortunately, he had some kind of a injury on his shoulder and had to have surgery. So that didn't happen this year. Hopefully next year. Um, the greatest thing you could do would be to have a diver take some of that down with a battery that could last and put it in the water so it didn't need to be brought in and out to avoid vandalism, theft, what have you. Yeah. And then go down and get it after a 30-day, you know, two-week, yeah. four-week, six-week schedule. Then yeah. you'd really have some good data because you'd be able to pull it from when it got dark. And that dark data would probably be very... Um, pristine compared to the daytime when you're fighting the the motor engines in the in the same waterway. Yeah, well, hopefully um, things will go better next year, and we'll have more people there. And I probably I'm going to start planning for next year, probably sometime in January. So I always try to get a running go at all this. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe next trip you can come back and we can do some more if you're up for it. Well, just as you noticed, when um, I arrived, the the rubber watercraft probably would not s suit your build and mine at the same time. So just being aware of that, the, the hope would be there's some of a, a harder bottom watercraft we might be able to make use of to get you off the shoreline a little well, bit. I think if I can just find a cheap boat with a trailer at some point, I might even be able to keep it at Julio's over the winter and not have to worry about having to, you know, pay to have it stored, just get a boat cover and cover it up. I don't know. I'm looking into that. Just be aware there, the maintenance on a boat, it's whether you use it a lot or a little, there's still an annual maintenance to it, and and you 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 don't be surprised by anything that would come up. That's my dad's advice from the past. Well, yeah, uh, I went through the same thing with Will and his boat. He had a lot of problems. We were when we were there the last trip. We were going to go out, and then all of a sudden, all the steering stopped working. The the steering mechanisms in the boat weren't working and we had to pull it out yeah and fix that before we could go back out so the, yeah i mean it's always something and unfortunately in this area in general let's just say in the northeast the amount of trained mechanics that uh you have access to very few and far between and it's rarely you can get a emergency job done quickly yeah Without, and it's always expensive too. You, you got some favors getting called in if you if you're hoping to get it done quick. So those yeah. are the only things there you're facing. For I'm a, I'm a football person, so the old team adage was you're either getting better or you're getting worse, and you you only can think there. Getting better gives you more data to read. 
So, is there any last things you want to contribute and add and points you want to get in? Well, I'd like to participate with the Beasts of Britain, Andy McGrath, one of your close associates, not only with the Champlain Zoological Inquiry Group, but also as a, a person who looks up to you in a, in a sense that I recognize, somewhat younger than you and I. He's doing a North American update for Beast of Britain. I'd like to put a plug in for St. Regis Village, Ganadago, one of our older parts of the reserve. There, there was a day when the St. Lawrence Seaway was put into place that all the water stopped at a certain point down river. You, can you imagine this? Ah. And I would have gone back and looked to see because now I'm intrigued by this, were there any geographic studies done in that brief time before they opened up the locks to generate the, the, water, the hydropower, but also to, there was German submarines that went up the St. Lawrence River in World War II, and I think one of the reasons that the locks went in, in addition to the, the normalizing of the strong current, was to protect against intrusions like that. So the locks probably create a problem for some of our interest in animal life as large as the Lake Champlain might support. But what our area is known for giant serpent-like examples, and I, I don't know if we can get by and say it could be the hybrid eels that have been stuck there and they're just gorging themselves. We've got contamination from the factories there, which included the PCBs, which when you see how that affects wildlife, it makes it gigantism as a feature of that within one generation. Mm -hmm. So the sturgeon got big and the 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 musky got big and the pikes got real big and the men and the mostly the fishermen it started with but eventually it worked its way through the food chain people started getting the the arthritis in their hands and in their feet and it was disquieting the the misshapen bodies of these fishermen and they said you can't keep eating this fish it's changing your body literally in one generation from where it was healthy to eat that food and then you couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, is there an area there by the church, there's an area called Yellow Island and there's been an area that's supposedly been dived on by the Cousteau Society in the past. And of course, as an investigator, I contacted them. And they claim never to have records of diving in that area. But the, the oral tradition is from the mid eighties that Jacques Cousteau was not willing to dive in that area because of the size of what he was bumping into below the surface. And that may have included aggressive eels. Mm. We've had people that have been on the river all hours of the day. And some of them coming back over at night from Canada would bump into these things in the water and they were as big as logs. Mm. So there's an area there that supposedly has two of these creatures and there is some local traditions about that when the days of the fishermen were in place that there were offerings made to these serpents to help protect the men rather than create uh, any danger to them. And what occurred was as the river was polluted, the fishermen left that career path and the obligations to the creatures were ignored. And as a result, there'd been abnormal number of deaths within a particular family that occurred as a result of not maintaining sim symbiotic relationship with these apparently long lived serpent creatures. And the name of the island, Yellow Island, it may have some reference to the nature of these creatures although they've been described more of a dark color but um i would want to go back to that day when the water was dammed up and see one what happened to these cave areas did they retain water and that might have been some way to maintain some life in there 
Yeah. But two, we also have the oral traditions that there's lava tubes or there's some sort of a formation, a crack, for instance, a fracture possibly yeah. that connects this area with Lake Champlain and that there may be some long-term transit ways there. Is that true? That is I've, heard, I've, I've heard it from more than one person and they weren't young. Yeah, so, well, there's all sorts of uh, underground rivers that fish migrate in different places. So, yeah, it's certainly possible. Um, and I would think that they're probably due to all the volcanism that was happening in this region back during the Paleozoic, Mesozoic eras, there's probably a good possibility of voided lava cubes like you were talking about. Um, my biggest concern about the timeline is when the ice age was here and of course we've discussed the champlain sea the dominance of that body of water here yeah. how much did the glaciation re retreat affect the lava tubes in terms of filling those in because of the nature of the the soil being tilled at at such at such weight and pressure that it may have had like a road grader effect. So yeah. I don't know, but I, I give it thought that there could be both theories in place without them being exclusive of each other. Yeah. I'd, al I'd also say that there's some, there's some relevance to the above ground cryptozoology in this area. I found it to be quite bereft or lacking of any Bigfoot sightings in this area. And it's of an area that's swampy and low, low to the ground directly next to me where I'm speaking from is a, a water source, which is constantly pumping out of a, um, a pipe next door. And if the water ever went out here on my well, I would have no hesitation to go over there and bottle some of that. The Army Corps of Engineers oddly has another has a designation of an acre on the other side of this water aquifer point. So I'm at a point where, and you, you turned me on to this, that there was a Zooglodon whale which was discovered in Norfolk, New York. And that was in the late 80s. And it's because we've got sand right at our very, very close to the topsoil here where I'm- Well, it's probably, I'm, probably a Champlain Beach Sea beach. That's where they find a lot of these marine fossils are in sand blowouts, former beach deposits. So I guess if there's one thing to be said from where I'm commenting from, it's that it may have been a low point of the Champlain Sea or close to it, with yeah. a little bit of topsoil over the top. Well, when but, they found when they found the whale in Charlotte, Vermont, in 1849, it was up on a bluff. And the reason why it was up on the bluff is that the Champlain Sea was 200 feet deeper than modern day Lake Champlain. So that bluff back thousands of years ago would have been the beach. Right. That's why it's so much higher than the, the level today. So in reference to the seaway going in, that becomes somewhat of an access point for our Fortean information and reports. The yeah. one thing that's been stated in reference to the power dam is that for, at least since the late 80s, and that's the earliest reports I found, that there's been a slew of sightings of unidentified flying objects following those power lines. And furthermore, there's been you know, unidentified submerged objects moving up, up river against the current in the St. Lawrence River. So we can, I, we can eliminate certain things from that because, among others, they were fully illuminated as they went up that waterway. All I can say is it's an interesting area to live. And yeah. whenever there's a sighting, I tend to follow up on it because it's, uh, it's something that you have to kind of look at from different points of view. I also would, would finish here and say there's such a number of law enforcement and border control agencies that I'd be quite interested to determine through freedom of information request 
have they any reports on their field patrols and their telemetry that they haven't made public yet? I'm, I'd like to go at it a little bit like the Black Vault has done in this specific area, though. I don't know if you've ever read a book called Invisible Residence by Ivan Sanderson, but the subject of that book is underwater UFO sightings. It's a wonderful book. It was ahead of its time. I don't have my hands on it, but I do own a copy. I have a PDF scan copy of it somewhere in my archives. Yeah. Very good. And, and Sanderson deserves a revival. I guess I'm uh, maybe a fanboy of his, but to me, he gave a little sensibility to the writing and kind of was able to stay in the middle of some of those expanding knowledge areas. Jacques Vallée, of course, very influential. But if you speak French, I think you have a benefit to reading into his work, although it's translated. Sanderson, to me, occupied the Marlon Perkins, I think, of our cryptozoology era because he had a basis in science in one sense, but he was also, his writing was very popular in, in terms of an audience. Yep. I've read a lot of this stuff. <clears throat> a lot of people consider him and Bernard Hubelman's the founding fathers of cryptozoology. And Hubelman's another example of translation, him being Belgium, from Belgian, and uh, the the language, it took quite a while to get that book, his, his seminal book to be translated. So I guess we look at Sanderson as a bridge to those other scholars. Yeah. And we'll be welcoming a book from you at some point in the future. Yep, probably next year. I'm, I'm knee deep in the middle of writing it. So I provided you with a few contacts that I would describe as non-political. And they should find themselves intrigued and at least interested by your inquiries. And I don't think there's any problem with getting their opinions as they have them to offer. Thank you for your help. And it's, uh, it's nice to have contacts among the tribal people uh, because, you know, they would have been probably the first people to encounter these creatures in North America. So their traditions definitely have a place in the story at the beginning. As of last week, I've established contact with Chief Donald Stevens there and of the Abenaki Confederacy in Vermont. He's busy at the present time, but I will be letting him know that you may have some inquiries also if he has any interest in that. I'll try to check that out. Thank you. Just a short update on the Zuyu Maru work that you did. I've made some outreach through academic contacts I have to Japanese colleges as well as government officials. I did have the one response from the library that ran some interference for me and contacted that department where everyone was younger. They didn't have the files on hand for that case. But I do think that there's enough silence I'm getting back that they know that there's a compelling interest in gathering any of that elastoidin material from the remainder of the genetic samples that were taken before the specimen was dumped into the ocean there by New Zealand. And yeah. I'm at the level now to either contact the Prime Minister of Japan as well as the U.S. Ambassador to see if they'd be willing to advance this. But I've already contacted the Minister of Fisheries, and I didn't hear anything back. But I also have tried to clue in any of the academic um, representatives from those colleges. You know, those colleges have changed names several yep. times along the that. way. There's and a possibility that, that Michihiko Yano may still be alive. I've been trying to find out. That's the guy that measured it and cut the samples and took the photographs. He'd be the one that I also would try to get to. Yeah. But if we, if we have to, I will contact the Prime Minister of Japan. 
And I've made the point that it's a non-political issue of pride, national pride to the Japanese people that they've co commemorated a, a national postal stamp for the uh, sighting and the whole event. And that at this time, Japan is looking for positive publicity while, while struggling to deal with the pandemic. Uh, the Olympics aren't really going well for them. There's pressure there from the Pacific Rim militarily. This would be a good opportunity to develop some access to those samples. And the only thing I'd hate to hear is you have to pay you, me, and the zoological inquiry would have to figure out a way to pay for that testing. So yeah. that, that, the only concern I have is sometimes you get what you ask for because Where it are would. The Japanese cryptozoologists. I've been trying to find them. And well, I've I've also gone up. I've gone into that, and what I found was any any cryptozoological groups in Japan were related to U.S. military occupation forces. And those people are transient to the assignments of their spouses or ah. themselves as uh, service people. And a lot of them focused on, like the Okinawa group, they were focused on ghosts. Okay, I understand that is a preponderance on that, on that geography there. But there's also original Okinawans who don't consider themselves Japanese. Yeah. So those are the ones that I'd like to reach out to. And maybe there's a, what, what we're not hitting on is the right word here. Because they're not advertising themselves in a way. There's one guy who supposedly has a cryptozoologic zoologic based museum. And I found his name mentioned numerous times in articles. But when you try to reach the guy or the, the museum... It's essentially, it's, there's nothing there. It's just a hollow. At one time, it may have been active, but and the guy's on Facebook, but he has not responded. Well, so, good luck. Well, that's why I'd rather hit the politicians, because you can convince them of something, and these other people, they're, they're probably not in the numbers we'd like to see to mm -hmm. gain an association that you could build on further projects with. Yeah. So has the weather calmed down there? We had heavy rain earlier. It's humid, thunder, lightning. We had some, some downpours, and you have flooding in some low-lying low areas. So it's the only thing, I guess, if you were out on the water today, you had to get to shore pretty quick. We're baking down here in Gatorland. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sure, though, as you know, it may increase in the future. So yeah. If if you're, I know you recently got some fans when you got back home, yeah, and hopefully those are helping you. Yeah, I've had an interesting contact with some people south of you who were visiting up here last week. Mm -hmm. I'll have an update at a later time. They're Mikasuki Nation traditional members, and I interviewed them on a number of topics. And Is that part of the Seminoles? They're distinctive from the Seminoles, but they are a bordering, bordering culture and nation. Ah, okay. So I guess that's it for my updates. And if you had any questions, I'd no, be I think we pretty much well covered everything. And um, I'm going to include some samples from the hydrophone recordings that we got while we were there. So thank you again for your help. And... Um, I appreciate any help you give me in the future, and uh, let's keep in touch and keep working together. Well, you're welcome. I admire your tenacity. I don't hold it against you that you don't have the academic credentials because you've more than made up for it in the reading. If I were to proctor some of your background, I would say you've exceeded the minimum levels for academic accreditation. Well, you know, thanks. the system, it doesn't work that way, but it yeah. should. You should get real life exposure, like CLEP almost, as a yep. as a as a agreement there that you've done the work, and this is just a basically an acknowledgement there that that you couldn't go to college for what you're interested in doing. You yeah. you could find yourself structured into being muzzled because you're trying to get a job in zoological science or something in the marine world. 
So well, you're much freer in your own way than exactly, not having yes, I know this. some I of mean, those. I, I am aware of several cases where professional zoologists' careers were ruined by delving into cryptozoology. Let's just say that there's people out there with art degrees that are writing books and that's their livelihood and good for them. Mm -hmm. But none of us are an expert, despite my own academic background. In any of this until one of us somehow strikes the item that we're looking for and brings it ashore or brings it in from the woods or wherever it would be found it's oh. a bag them and tag them kind of a mentality yeah. here and i don't well, see I mean, you as if they're if they're real animals surely we will find remains of dead ones at some point I don't see you as a person, though, that would kill the last one to prove oh, that no. they were alive. No, no, no. I'm looking for ones that are all already dead. So, so to me, again, I'm acknowledging a non-orthodoxy there, which is the not completely a scientific method. I'd like to be able to recreate any any signs of these that you'd identify electronically. But let's be honest. At some point, they're going to make a technology that's going to let them see below the water level to the point that the light ends under underwater. Yeah. And not only are we going to find a lot of shipwrecks all over the world, because there's also going to be technology that's going to find precious metals much easier, almost as a radar hit. But we're visually going to be able to see into the water level of the, the oceans and lakes particularly. I yeah. think there'll be an answer, but I don't know if it's in our lifetime. We'll see. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, well, thank you very much, too. And Have I'll be in touch. Have a good you. one. You too.